Yes, now it's time to um, place in the components that should be in these sockets. And I did have quite a few of them here. And I do have some more of them here. And I have also found some more replacement that's HCT. That is not in this box and not in this box, but we have to source them elsewhere. Or we can try with these LS kind of chips. And I would also like to show you, I was complaining about this packaging that's not similar to anything that's supposed to be the way to pack chips. This is from Moser and this is HGT 540M. And they have packed it first in this box here. And this box is meant to withstand some noise and high voltage that's coming in as rays and this is conductive on the inside and shield that way but here you can see me breaking this seal and inside here you see this thick foam packaging and just one ship inside this is to go overboard totally the other way of course put this in here until we need it so i get this packaging out of the way and they also have this kind of packaging that's almost as good at least for us hobbyists you first have this anti-static bag here and then you have yeah let's break up this tube they have this bent over like so and they have packed this in a piece of, of, of tubing to avoid the leg breaking and this tubing is also anti-static in its nature so it's not collecting static charge when the ship is gliding towards this plastic. And this is 138M HCT. I ordered three ships I think from Moser. And now my task is to place what I got of these things. In here and as you remember I also had some of these chip in my general collection so I will just start to place out uh, what I have and I will try to use HCT as far as I, I have them and here as you remember is the memory chips for the, the screen memory and here we have the socket that we made for this Sony ship that should be a bit wider and this is all special sockets and here you have the, the socket for the video controller chip and this is for the one with the special spacing. So we will just try to fit this in as we, um, as we go along and when it comes to the, the room we can't do that until we are finished but the memory of course we can place. So let's just get started on this. And please, please be aware of static electricity when you are doing this kind of work. I both have my earthed chair, I have my earthed mat on the bench, I have my strap around my waist, and that ought to be enough. But in addition, it's nothing bad with having a wrist strap as well. And as we are using HCT logic, which is much more easy damageable with static discharge than TTL, it's very wise to be precautious here. Yes, the first one in. Maybe I should test these ships before I, I put them in. That I can either use the Retro Ship Tester Pro or the Mini Pro Programmer, but I do think it will go much much faster with the Mini Pro Programmer, so I might do that. It will be of course less, less exciting when we turn this on if we know that every ship is working, but we might as well do that as this ship is sourced from a lots and lots of different sources over the years. Yes, so this one is okay, and this one should go into this socket here, and of course it should go this way. And while this seems like tedious and boring work, I'm enjoying myself. And this is about the same as placing the keycaps. It makes such a huge dent in the appearance of the finished product that it's, it's almost zen in placing all these chips and testing them.
And of course, not all chips are testable without the Retro Chip Tester Pro, and this is the HC670. And that is a 4x4 register file, and it's almost like a RAM chip in organization, and this is not testable with the, the Mini Pro programmer. So I don't bother to test this in this round. And here comes some of the more expensive ones and this is the huge major chips and also the memory chips for the video card is on uh, this uh, board and this is the Y9958 chip and this is the one with the 1.78 millimeter pin uh, distance and this is really a joy to put into this uh, socket because this is, as I said, is a quite high quality socket and the um, snap it makes when it fits into the socket is just a great feeling. And since all of these chips has been stocking around in boxes and cupboards for more than 30 years, there is of course a bit of bent legs and such on them. And while this 8910 chip is compatible uh, with the original Sun chip, I think I will take another look around to see if I find the original chip. So I put this aside for now. And here I only have 574 series logic chip left to place. And I don't have HCT parts for all of them, I just have some LS parts for some. So we use what we have. These ones is going to be 150 trees and they are going to be the LS 150 trees I think. I do have different variants but I only have HC and not, not HCT but I do think we will do just fine with these. I will do a quick test. Oh, yeah. oh let's get this little bugger to stay in there. And this tests both as a 7453 and as a 4539 chip. They share the same footprint and they would be pin compatible if there was a HC logic chip. But as this is an LS, this a bit difference in the logic levels, but that is not tested on the Mini Pro programmer. And then we have this and we have the... HCT 125, we have two HCT 273s, so we're going to check out those. Yeah, so I do have these both in LS and HC, and there I have them in two variants. And I think I'm just going to use the, the Toshiba ones, I'm going to test them first. Yeah, and you find this as a 273, just fine. And I am test this one. That just went fine too, and I'm also going to test two of the LS ones, in case we have to use them. Then the rest of these is going back into storage. HCT 125, it's this one, and that's just one I forgot to find. Yeah, and it tests out okay. Ah, look how nice and shiny these legs are. Even after being stored for many, many years. And this is one of the 273s. I do have to use a, a double check here to see if the EM2149 is compatible with the 8910 that I have here. And I have to take the RetroShip Tester Pro and test these four memory chips. And this is the GALS that needs to be programmed. And these are the rooms. Uh, th no, this is one room and it's one uh, RAM. I can of course find the, the RAM chip. I don't know if this is testable in the Retro Ship Tester Pro. I will check. So then we just jump to the Retro Ship Tester Pro. Yeah, this should be pin compatible. So I just plug this in. I'm not sure if I have the original chip or not. Like so. 
In the data description there is some mention about the offset being slightly different on these ships and that might meet, meet some volume or sound differences, but I do think that will just work fine since it is stated here that it should be compatible. I suppose it is possible to read the display here now, and we have the four DRAMs to test out. 64K by 4, and this is the one we should use to test. That passed just fine. That's one. And again. I do have to upgrade the firmware on this, it's coming several new revisions since I last upgraded this. So I'm going to look into that in the near future. I'm probably going to do a separate video on that. I also got hold of the SD card reader and other stuff. And I also was thinking about making some kind of box and some ready-made power supply for this. Now I'm as usual supplying this just to these ad hoc leads and that is easy to make mistakes. Yes, and that's one more. That's not a good sign. It might just was some bad contact. I've seen it before. I'm not sure where these ships come from. I had them laying around for ages, but if it's the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages or the somewhat newer Dark Ages, I'm not sure. And this actually was... This was all neck ships, but I have one that stated neck USA, but it has the same designation, it's a 10 or 100 nano delay on this and it's the same on the others, and it's also stated the same D41464C-10, but it's just stated USA on one and Ireland on the other three. Okay, I tested fine, and the last one. I also have to make the cable for the keyboard, and that's a 16 pin like that. I can of course use just jumper wires and connect them like that. I do think that every one of these is in use. I have to check. And I also have to check if I have to populate some of these jumpers. I probably are. You have some flash ROM A18 select, address line 0. I have to see what that is about. Yes, and that passed also with flying colors. And then it was to check if it was um, it possible to test this. This should be a static RAM. There is no biggest. This is 32K. It's a 512K by 8. So this was 64, 108K. There is nothing so big here. I do wonder if it's supported with a firmware upgrade. I might try to, to check that out. But as for now, there is no way to test this. So I'm just going to... Uh, to turn off this. Yeah, as you can see, the latest firmware is indeed supporting this, and you have to have the SD card extension to uh, test this. Yes, and then it's about programming the goals and programming the rooms, and I do have to, uh, I do have to get hold on the right chips to try. There are three goal chips on this uh, board, and they have to be uh, programmed. And the way to program a, a GAL ship uh, like this is to um, supply it with a JED file. And this file is supposed to be here somewhere. And here you have them actually. And here you can see you have the three ships. You have the ship select, you have the slot and slot direction and slot select. And these are the files we are searching for. This is the GID files and they are just text files. It's nothing uh, secret about them. So this is the fuse map that has to be programmed into this ship. And this was the slot select. And we have the slot direction. It's about as long. And we have the ship select. And it this one, and it's uh, several ways that you can uh, you can do this. I always 
just mark this text and paste it into a normal text file and save it as a JID file. And I just burn it like that. So here we have our three JED files. And that is what we are going to program into these GALs. And the GALs we are using is the Atmel RTF 16 8 VB and it's a quite common GAL ship and we just load the JED file and we have loaded the JED file and we burn it and we can see that it also erases and verifies in the same operation so this should be good to go. And as I haven't prepared any labels for this, I hurry to put them in the right slot in the motherboard. And the slots are actually marked with which function they should have. And that fits with the description of the JED files. So hopefully they will get into the right slots. For the other two gold ships, it's just the same procedure. I just load the file and burn it in and place them in after I finished burning them. And I see that there has been several revision of these gold ships, but I do think that the ones on the GitHub is the latest ones. But um, we have no way of knowing, of course, until we have tested the functionality of these. Here I have uh, just placed some socket leads like this, with a uh, female in each side and just fill them in there. But I'm a bit confused because I saw someone stating that you could just use some longer pins and you could make an arrangement for putting them straight to this connector here but that surely does not work because this is pin 1 up here it's clearly marked and pin 1 is down here. So I have to, to check if this actually is the right pin out or not. So I will measure out to see if this yeah makes sense somewhat before I power on. But if this is the right pin out then we don't have to do anything more about the lead because I do think that this works just fine. It will give us the necessary uh, flexibility and if it just keeps in the socket it will be okay to do this. So now I only have uh, some small items left. I have not placed this, this and this capacitor and that is for color subcarrier I think all of them and I also have this jumper here that is for the higher or lower part of the EEPROM and I have to program the EEPROM itself. So that's my next part and that is what I'm going to start with now. When it comes to the BIOS I have to admit I cheated a bit because I didn't want to test this board with more yeah what can I say variables than necessary so I was looking for a ready built ROM there is a lot of available MSX kits and some have made changes and so on but I was going to follow Sergey's advice and test the board first with the C BIOS that is a remake and almost complete library of the MX2 implementation that is open source. And the MSM Makers has made a really good website and although this is in Spanish it's possible to make out what we need down here. And I was using this Google Drive link to actually download this uh, ROM image. And this contains a lot of ROM images and it's more than we actually need for this build. So I just picked one of them and that is this one. So what did I use? You have here the whole library and it contains a lot of files and it's a lot of different builds and stuff in here but I was using this one. And this is a Omega MSX2 international version for PAL with the CBIOS image. And this is a 512k file and it contains both the Omega BIOS and another specially manufactured BIOS. But that doesn't matter much because we have the ability to change the BIOS with the switch. So we will be able to use the, the CBIOS image inside of this. 
and you also have some more images here to build your own MSX and you can also start out like I intended to do at first and use this C BIOS image here and you actually just unpack this and you use the make and build files to compile this and you can see here inside the room image you actually have the, the C, C BIOS basic disk and main and music and subrooms they are here all of them and if you use the script here to build this BIOS it will actually build a bin file that you can burn into a room but as I don't know if I'm doing that correctly I'm going to use this file that is already approved and working by the MSX makers so that's the file I will be getting into my EEPROM and of course I have lots of EEPROMs and the EEPROM is reprogrammable so I can do this many times if I'm not satisfied with this result and the ship I'm using here is one of those that I got that was actually packed in styrofoam and the legs are bent a bit all over the place so I have to use uh, first um, easy way to um, to take one and one pin and then I kind of give up and use the straightener and after that it's yeah it looks better but it has to be bent in place a bit before I can put it in the socket and even though this is nice and shiny on the pins the ship itself looks yeah rather battled around the edges and now we are closing in for the final phase before we can test things and I test that I have a power supply plug that fits into the connector and that I have this keyboard is meant to stand on top of the main board and to do that we really need to fit some spacers in between that means that we can put the keyboard on top of the main board without shorting out something because you have the older solder pads and all the pins sticking out on the bottom of the keyboard so we need to be able to put this on top without shorting out something and the standoff we are using here is some plastic standoff that I got in a kit from some uh, murky aliexpress shop and they're working kind of okay and they have the nylon nuts also included in the package normally i prefer brass and brass is of course better but when you are doing this kind of work where the keyboard is kind of sliding on top of something and you can't fix the nuts and all the the pieces before you are really finished troubleshooting stuff nylon it's much better and it will keep things from shorting out and by the way this is three millimeter thick standoffs and i think they are about 20 high or something and as you can see on the bottom here I'm using not nuts and not other feet I'm using a shorter variant of the standoff as feet to lift the board from the ground actually and if I'm going to place this in a case or something later on I can actually use these standoffs to fasten the board and then fasten the keyboards afterwards so I'm going to leave it like that for now it will be good enough to complete the testing and might also some light use of this computer if we get it working in the end yeah, and this is a normal kind of two steps forward and one step back. I do have to rewire the keyboard as I do think that this is uh, faulty and I have exchanged one row on um, one side and have to, yeah, it's better to do it all over again, I think. So that means everything I did yesterday with this keyboard was wrong and I have to rewire and hopefully there will be no damage. Otherwise I have connected up everything and are ready to, uh, to test. And with damage I mean these headers I'm using here, they're not very good. So when I have first connected them to a quite wide connector, I'm not sure if I good enough contact afterwards. Otherwise we have now connected the video signal and I have connected an audio jack also to the signal and this goes to my trusty LG 22 inch LCD TV kind of monitor and of course now they are going on top here yes like so that should be and like so and I have connected here video it says video in but I do think that this is into the SCART connector and this is the video in and this is audio in to the SCART connectors and yeah I think I'm, I'm ready to um, to make a small test I will only 
tidy up here a bit. So I'm sure that there is no short circuit or anything. And this we will leave, we will measure the voltage. And I have the connector here. And this should of course be center positive. And 5 volt, 5.09, and that's 5 volt. So I will just turn on the, the TV set. Dim the light and try to see what we got. At least we got the light here on the keyboard, but nothing much else is happening. So I can try to just solder in some temporary capacitors here, here and here to uh, see if that helps. I have not connected the, um, the battery either. That should not be necessary for, for the test. What did I say now? How can I be sure that the battery is not uh, needed? I don't even have bothered to check where it's connected and it's actually connected to the reset watchdog timer. And it stated here that via bat should be connected to, um, to ground if no battery is used and V out should be connected to VCC. So I'm not sure about this statement. I think it's better to be safe than sorry and put in a battery and let the reset watchdog timer do its thing. But at least there is nothing happening. It's drawing about 0 0.8 amps. So there is something running here. But I do have to trace up something. And I also don't know if this if this room ship is actually working. So this was just a, a preliminary test. But I will have to um, just put something in the, these capacitor holes to see if that will help and then I will do another test and measure out some things with uh, the scope I think. What I'm going to do here I'm just going to solder in these 20 picofarad capacitors and the reason for this is that this should be adjustable 30 picofarad capacitors and they are adjustable from some small value up to 30 Pico, so I don't think it's wise to put in the end value of this. So 20 pico, maybe 15 pico, but I don't have that. So 20 pico it is. We we'll just take a chance on that. And I'm just going to nibble this in place. I'm not going to do any permanent soldering on this. Like so. At last, least now the oscillator circuits are closed. So they should be able to oscillate but what frequency we really don't know so then it's just connecting up this again and power and nothing on the screen i'm just going to try to measure some uh, some values here take it the right way 4.97 and on the keyboard 4.92 that should be enough I will now try to connect this to a, a scope and see what happens. I'm not sure what other test procedure I should follow. There was some write-ups in the documentation that I will try. But the most obvious thing to try is to check out the oscillators and see if the clocks are running. And let's try the CPU clock. Six it should be. And the clock does not look bad. This could be a bit of error messaging because I have not calibrated the probe. But it stated here it's about 3.6 MHz. So I do think that uh, the clock to the CPU is okay. Yeah, let's now measure the rest of the clocks. Sorry for the flickering in the picture, these light sources do not normally cause this uh, kind of rolling. But today they does, I don't know why. I use the hosting of the crystal as ground and on this um, real-time clock chip, the RP5C001 something, this pin 17 here should be clock out and here we see it's 332 point something and that is close enough, so that's okay. And we also have the PAL clock up here, and this is a crystal of 4.433 something megahertz, 
and this is the 17, uh, 74 HCT04 ship and this is an inverter ship so this signal is actually inverted twice and this should be the output that's fed into the system yeah and as you can see this is uh, a good valid signal so all the clocks are okay and then we are going to the next culprit and that is at looking at the reset lines and the reset line on the C log is pin 26 and one two three four five six and this is actually stuck low and um, C log CPU has an active low input so this is kept in constant reset and I do have to remember and keep myself remembering this I have forgot to put in a battery what if I put a battery in? Oh, I put it in with the power on. Maybe not wise. I power cycle this then. And one, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, and now the reset is high. So actually, my first thinking about testing without the battery was of course stupid. You have to have the battery in to make this circuit not resetting the whole time. So, uh, are we good to go then? We probably are. I'm going to test again with a screenshot device. Let's do that. And let's see if I get some picture. Oh yes, I do. And this is loud and clear. Memory not found. I'm not sure where he's looking and what memory he is speaking about. We actually have two kinds of memory on this board. We do have here the video memory and we have here the Allianz memory chip that is 512k static RAM. And this is a circuit with unknown origin. I'm not sure when and, and why I bought this, but I do have some other ones in order. And of course there could be some yeah there could be some some jumpers but I think these jumpers here are just if you use this extended memory slot so i do think that this is it also can be something with the bios and now i'm testing with the c bios with the jumper in here where you have the, the highest bit set and if i try to take out the power and yeah, i'm actually getting nothing blank screen so it was stuck somewhere, now I'm not getting anything. But now I get the um, memory not found error message. Yes, at least we know something is running on this machine. We do have to try with another alliance ship and I'm not sure if I have any more. I might be having some ship like this in a project already that I can borrow. I will try to check that out. I can of course try with uh, this ship um, pulled out and see what happens then. Of course we are trying to pry this out as gently as we can because we need to um, maintain the integrity of the socket the ship i don't give much for i probably never did as this probably is uh, aliexpress part yeah let's try again yeah it gets the same memory not found so yeah at least we <laughs> i think we know what memory is is bad so I will try to look around and see if I have one of more these lying. Yeah, I found one more ship and this is my Micro 8088 also by Sergey Manilo and I'm going to take out one of these ships and these are parts I ordered from I don't remember if it was uh, DigiKey but I think it was. Try this out carefully. Yeah, so much for carefully. But it survived with only a slightly bent leg. And it does have the same designation, but this writing looks more solid and sturdy. Like so. And raise this like so. And make ready for screen capture. Cable management with short cables on a desk is not always an easy task, as in this case. I actually get the same out of memory error. 
Okay, then I have tested with one good memory chip, and that is really as far as I get in this uh, video. So, thanks for uh, for watching. Hope you can hit like and subscribe to the channel. That will really help us out. So I want to uh, hit the thousand mark for subscriber uh, this spring. And I hope to see you in my next episode. The next episode we will do some more fault finding around this memory chip. There will probably are some of the chips with memory decoding or some other stuff around here that's not working as it should. There also are some diagnostic ways on um, the MSX computers but on, if this is compatible with Surgery's design and what we have here I'm not sure. So, thanks for watching, hope to see you in the next one.